Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Get out your King James Bibles for English speaking people, perfect written word, and follow along. I thought we'd do it outside today, so because I'm going to do it outside, I'm just going to be reading from the clipboard. We're going to be reading verses from the King James Bible. You can always pause the video and keep turning. And uh, yes, I'm wearing my shirt that has my sponsor on it. You know, who it is I serve. I serve God through his perfect written word, KJV. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. I still thank the brother in Christ that got me this sweater. Um, my old sweater that you see me re wear sometimes, it's gotten really faded and everything. So we've been having really dry days lately. So I thought we would come outside. It's a beautiful morning. I've got a little blanket on. Victoria's sitting right next to me. Um, but we're going to finish up Jesus, Name Above All Names, Part 2. Okay, so once again, we're going through the hymn, we're seeing if it lines up with the scripture, because that's what we're supposed to do. When you hear something, someone says, this is of God, this is absolute truth, this hymn pleases God, you know, the, you'll hear people say, this pleases God, our response is supposed to be like the Bereans, we're supposed to say chapter and verse. The Bereans sought uh, the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. We're supposed to say chapter and verse. We're supposed to have that attitude that when someone says something that we've never heard, it doesn't mean it's wrong. There's times you can learn something new, brothers and sisters in Christ, but when you hear something, this needs to be our attitude. My prayer for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, is always, are you staying in the Word and prayer? Every day, are you staying in His Word and prayer? So when someone comes along with good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple, you're not a simpleton if you're staying in the Word of God and hiding it in your heart and living it. There's been preachers that really yelled at me, and they had every right to, <laughs> about you don't know that book like you should know that book. And that's, that's what we're pushing here, Brother Says Christ. You need to know this book like you need to know this book. That way when Satan tries to come along with his ministers that transform into the ministers of righteousness, they act like they're saved, but they're snakes, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. When they try to deceive you, you have the final authority in your hand. You have the perfect written word of God in your heart. You're not as easily deceived. We can still get deceived, brothers says Christ. I've been deceived. But if you're hiding this in your heart, it's, it's very hard for someone to deceive you. Very hard. But without going off in too much of a rant, we're going through the hymn. We did the first part, and this one might be another two parts, because I'm going to take my time. I'm not going to just speed through it like I did the first half. We're going to take our time, and we're going to go through, and we're going to talk about it together. Okay? Who wants a Bible study? Raise your hands. Who wants a Bible study? Uh, I do. I love Bible studies, but I need to slow down a little bit. Okay? We need to slow down and trust the Lord and take our time. Okay? Before we even get into this, the Bible talks about waiting on the Lord. Uh, we need to wait on the Lord. Uh, we need to be patient. That's something I'm working on is being patient. So the second rendition of uh, Jesus' name above all name, part two, we're going to go through the next uh, stanza that I sung in part one. So if you haven't seen part one, please go and watch part one. So the next stanza that I, because I know there's different versions of, of this hymn, because there's so many titles for God, we're going to go through some titles that aren't even in the song, because we just happen to come across them. But the first one is Jesus. The first hit, the part of the hymn was Jesus, name above all names, and it goes into it. But this one says Jesus, and then it goes in Lord God Almighty, Wonderful Counselor, okay, um, Light of the World, Prince of Peace, Hope of glory, man of sorrows, lamb of God. Okay. Lamb of God. So that's what we're going through today. So Jesus, turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, I keep bringing this up because, brother, sister Christ, it just, it breaks my heart because I don't want to ever become like this. But there's some men that get into ministry, they've been in ministry for a while, that their heart gets hardened and they get prideful, and they start getting an ego, they start getting chips on their shoulders, that they can come out with something that's totally heretical, totally wrong according to the scriptures, and they won't humble themselves and, and apologize and repent about it. Okay? For what we're going to go through here, there was a man that I learned from, okay? and he came out and said that Jesus shouldn't have been named Jesus. It should have been Emmanuel. And he purposely, purposely left out the two verses, and we're going to read one of them here. He purposely let out, left out verses where 
Joseph and Mary were commanded, commanded to name the child Jesus. He purposely, because the pride and the ego, he purposely left those verses out and said that they were in sin and that they were wrong for naming him Jesus. He should have been named Emmanuel. Right? Brother says, Christ, pray for men in ministry. I'm just going to drop right here. Right? Pray for men in ministry that they don't get puffed up and get too prideful. Pray for us, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we don't get too prideful and too puffed up that when we make something that's that heretical, we repent. Okay? Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as, a, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, I'll stop there for a second because I forgot to mention. When it comes to the pride, though, help us work on the pride. But one of the things you need to also pray for us, brothers and sisters Christ, is that when we do get prideful, that we can humble ourselves, that we get humbled by God and by the brethren. We get humbled. Okay, I'm not talking about causing division or backbiting or gossip or um, whatnot. I'm talking about humbling ourselves that we repent. This man that I'm talking about, cause I've already named him, I think, in the first video, but... He wouldn't repent. He, 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 he basically called God's word a lie. And the Bible says, as we go through here, the Bible says there's one meter between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. He called that a lie by saying his, it's not Christ Jesus, it's Emmanuel. Okay? He brought a lot of things into question and got people to question the word of God with that teaching. Okay? It's Jesus. Now, Emmanuel is, we went over Emmanuel in the first part of this series. Okay? It is a name for Jesus, absolutely. But Jesus is also another name. But Jesus is the name that's above all names. Okay? And I keep saying this, not Yeshua, not Yeha, I'm getting ahead of myself, not Yeshua, not Yahashua, not Billy Joe Bob. You just don't get to make up a name. Uh, it's not Jehovah. Jehovah is a title for God, and since Jesus is God, it's a title they can share. Okay, we're going to look in here like the mighty God. Okay. Absolutely, they can share titles. Oops. There's some deer down there. I can, you can share some titles and whatnot. But the name that's above all names is Jesus. The name whereby today, for the day, time of the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles, the name that's above all names is Jesus. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's one name under heaven, one name. Now, God has many names. Jesus has many names. But there's one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. It's, that, it's what the Bible teaches. Okay. Matthew 1.18. Now, start all over. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. The birth of Jesus Christ... No, no, it's at the birth of Emmanuel. No, no, it says Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Right. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. This goes back to our teachings we talked about, Brother Jesus Christ, that when you're espoused today, the way the lost world does it, don't want to go into it too much, but a woman can get engaged 50 million times and, and then finally get married and she's only been married to one man. Well, according to the Bible, she's been married to 50 men. Okay? An engagement's like being betrothed. That's your husband. You might not have consummated the marriage. They didn't consummate the marriage yet. Okay? Then Joseph, her husband, being a just bed, not willing to put, make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Okay? They hadn't come together and consummated the marriage. But you don't put someone away unless you're married. He was going to put her away. Okay? The world today doesn't take marriage seriously. Okay? They don't take marriage seriously. Okay? You can get engaged to a million men. Uh, you can get... A, a men can be engaged a million times and it's, it's no big deal. And you can break it off in a heartbeat. It's no big... When you choose... You need to be serious. Uh, in the Old Testament, there was a guy that made a vow to God. You need to be careful with your words. He made a vow to God, and he came home. The first, the first thing he saw, he would sacrifice to the Lord, and the first thing he saw was his daughter running out to meet him and greet him in the Old Testament. You don't just get engaged. I mean, engaged is the world's worth, but here, 
um, espoused. You don't get just get espoused on a whim. Okay, be careful. Okay, be patient. I failed that. I failed the Lord in this area. Some people say, "Oh, well, you're a hypocrite." No, I failed the Lord in this area and repented. Uh, my phone's ringing. We're out here. Verse 20. But while he thought on these things, he was going to put her away. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. See, that's something that got, got caught on to. Is it's a dream. Okay. But the angel of the Lord, because we te I teach this because the Bible teaches this, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's a pre-carnate uh, Jesus Christ. It's God manifest in the flesh. His, his body in the Old Testament. Jesus, the Son of God, when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, like we're reading here, it's God manifest in the flesh, but it's the likeness of sinful flesh. And we teach that Jesus gave up his incorruptible body for a corruptible one. In the Old Testament, it's the angel of the Lord. And some people teach, see here, the angel of the Lord is present at the same time Jesus is in the stomach of Mary. That's not true. Okay, It came to him in a dream. That's a difference. Okay, The angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. God was speaking to him in a dream. But still, great is the mystery of godliness. If you ask me, well, how does that work? You know, <clears throat> God the Father was dealing with Joseph in a dream, and in the dream he saw the angel of the Lord. That's what I believe. Okay? But the point is, is you have the angel of the Lord. That's, that's Jesus that's appearing to this man in a dream. And look what he says here. Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Jesus had the Holy Ghost in him when he was born. John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost in him when he was born. That, to me, that's one of the biggest things that says, hey, it is, when the Bible says, with child, you are with child. That is a person in your stomach. It's not a thing. Okay? It's a person. It's a living person the moment you conceive. Okay? But conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. There's a big movement right now about Yeshua or Yahushua. Well, here's the problem that they have. The New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. The old, when it says, it is written, it is written, they took the old Hebrew from the Old Testament and they translated it into Greek. But the New Testament was only written in Greek. This, the name Jesus, is not a translation from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Jesus is a translation from Greek to English. Now, they're coming out and they're trying to tell you that, well, the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew. That's a lie. That's a total lie. Don't listen to them, brothers and sisters Christ. That's a lie. Some are saying, well, what we're doing here is we're taking uh, Greek, and we have a Greek translation into English, Jesus, and we're taking the, Greek translation, uh, the English translation and translating it into Hebrew. That's still wrong. If you're going to do it the right way, and nobody in their right mind would do this, but if you're going to do it in your right way, you'd have to take the Greek word, and I don't know how to do this, I don't know anybody alive today that knows how to do this. You'd have to take the Greek word and translate it into the Hebrew word, and then take that Hebrew word and translate it into English. Okay? Or you take the Greek word and you translate it into Hebrew and be able to speak the old Hebrew. Not the Hebrew that we have today, but the old Hebrew. But why would you translate it from... Um, Greek to Hebrew to English and, and go through all those steps when it's just short <coughs> it's a shortcut it's better just to go from Greek to English you're only going from you're just translating from one language to one language why translate through 50 languages I'm exaggerating but why translate through multiple languages till we get to the language we want yeah. right. but ultimately it still comes down to this Yeshua is Joshua and they're trying to say Joshua saves Joshua never saved anybody God saved Israel, and he used Joshua. God saved Israel, and he used Moses. God saved Israel, and he used King David. David was a man after God's own heart. You know what it means to be a man after God's own heart? 
David was all about the will of the Lord. He even sung about in hymns how he loves the will of the Lord and his desire is to see the will of the Lord and to do the will of the Lord. When you're a man after God's own heart, it's about doing God's will and doing things God's way and giving God all the glory and giving Him all the praise and giving Him all the thanks. That's what King David did. Not all the time he failed the Lord, but that's another study. The point is here, though, the Jews had a problem with giving God all the glory. They wanted a man. That's why they rejected him as king. They wanted a man as king like all the other nations. An earthly man as king like all the other nations. And they had a problem with lifting up men in the past. They revere Abraham. Um, John the Baptist, he had problems with the Sadducees and everything. Oh, we have Abraham as our father. Say not within yourselves you have Abraham as your father. For God is up to these stones able to raise up children of Abraham. They kept elevating men of the past and they refused, refused to elevate God Almighty. Yeshua is Joshua saves. They're elevating a man from the Old Testament. Joshua from the Old Testament. They elevated Moses. We have Moses. Not we have God, the one true God, the Lord God Almighty, like we're going through some of the titles today. No, it's, they elevate men. They want men. And guess what? God came as a man in the likeness of sinful flesh. He humbled himself and became a servant. But he came in the form that they wanted. And they still rejected him. What is Yeshua? You're still rejecting Jesus Christ. Yahashua, you're still rejecting Jesus Christ. You're rejecting God Almighty as King. They're still doing it to this day. Be not deceived, brother says Christ. The name is Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the name by where you get saved today in the church age. God had different titles throughout time throughout different dispensations in the Bible throughout history but for today the name to get saved we preach Jesus to lead people to Christ to lead people to God he's the one that reconciles us to God Jesus Christ the name Jesus is so important the next part the next line in the in the hymn Lord God Almighty okay Lord God Almighty there's three parts to this. But Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Okay? That's why we say, is come in the flesh. It's eternal when you say, is come. It has no end. Is come is future. No end. Is come. Eternal. Okay. Is to come. Talking about a future. Okay. He's eternal. He's past, present, future, eternal. But Lord God Almighty. Now some people get confused because it has a capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Okay, yes, it's saying Lord capitalized like that. It's important. It's a title, and it's very important. But we're going to find out here what it's saying is it's talking about the Godhead. This whole thing, Lord God Almighty, is the Godhead. It's Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father all together. That's why you have it as a capital L-O-R-D. It's Jesus Christ who is God the Father along with the Holy Spirit. Because you have the word Almighty, which we're going to talk about. Okay, Lord God Almighty. Just because it has full caps doesn't mean that's not talking about Jesus Christ. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the infamous 1 Corinthians 8, 6. I put this challenge out to the uh, Trinitarians. And some of them tried to just explain it away like it's nothing. And I, and I just... I, I don't know what to do. I just pray for those people that claim to be Bible believers, but they like to explain this away. They like to replace words in here, subtract words in here, replace words in here, ignore words in here, and they call themselves Bible believers. And it's like, the infamous 1 Corinthians 8, 6. 
The challenge was, this says right here, there's only one capital G, God the Father. If you say God the Son, then you're calling this a lie. You're saying God's Word is not perfect, it's an error, it's a lie. When you say God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's read this though. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but one capital G God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him. See, God the Father created everything. No, 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 there's verses that says, uh, for thou, talking about Jesus Christ, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Then it talks about the Holy Spirit creating all things. The Spirit of God. Let's keep reading here. And one capital L Lord, whether it's a capital L Lord and lowercase o-r-d, or capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, there's one Lord, Jesus Christ. Is God Lord? Absolutely. Why? Because Jesus is God. Is Jesus God? Capital G God? Absolutely. Because God the Father is Jesus Christ. One Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. See, there He is. Jesus created all things. God the Father created all things. Jesus created all things. The Holy Spirit created all things. The Godhead created all things. Here we see a passage about the Godhead. Okay? It talks about the Holy Spirit, omnipresent, almighty, the glory of the Lord. The Holy Spirit goes out, and sometimes you can see the Holy Spirit by the glory of the Lord. And we talked about this. How is the glory of the Lord shown? The Holy Spirit shown? manifest himself physically because you can't see a spirit but you can see the glory of the Lord surrounding the spirit in the Old Testament you had smoke during the day over the tabernacle and you had fire at night the Bible talks about how Jesus says I am we're gonna talk about him being the light of the world okay light shone down on um, Paul it was Saul and then became Paul okay? the Holy Spirit the glory of the Lord can manifest itself physically in light, in cloud slash smoke, and in um, fire. When the Holy Spirit came down on G Jesus, he already had the Holy Spirit in him. He's God manifested in the flesh. It's the Godhead. Godhead is God the Father in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus had God the Father in him and the Holy Spirit in him at birth. Period. The people try to argue this. You can argue all you want, but you're going to be arguing against God, not me against God. What is this that they're seeing? They're seeing the glory of the Lord come down on, the, on Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit coming down with the glory of the Lord surround him, cloud that looked like a dove, and it came down like as a dove. And it was a sign for John the Baptist. It, not everybody saw it. God sees everything. I had someone try to correct me. God sees our, We're talking about mankind down here when I said nobody saw it except John. We're talking about down here. Okay, you say Jesus saw well. Jesus is God. People are so quick to, to correct sometimes. I took the correction and said, Yes, you're right. Jesus saw it too. Jesus is God. Jesus saw it. But I'm talking when I said made that statement, I was talking about us, mankind, his creation. Nobody saw it except John the Baptist. It was a sign specifically for him. But you have Lord God Almighty. There's only one capital G God. So you got Lord, that's Jesus Christ the body, God, the Father, there's only one capital G, God, the Father, Almighty, the Holy Spirit, holy, 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 each one is holy, each one is of God. God the Father, manifest in the flesh is what Jesus is. He's the Lord God Almighty, manifest in the flesh. They're all one and the same. Genesis 35, 11, we read, Genesis 35, 11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. God Almighty. No, this Lord's not there. <laughs> okay? This is God the Father directly talking to somebody. Not in his presence, but talking to somebody. Okay? Exodus 6, 3. Exodus 6, 3. But once again, Jesus is God. They share the same title. God the Father's sitting on the throne in heaven, and he's in Jesus Christ. I don't want to get to this. is like a big, deep study, but how does God deal with mankind? He, do, he deals with mankind through his capital W word, his body, his flesh, through Jesus Christ, his son, in the Old Testament, angel of the Lord, in the New and, and when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
It's still his body. It's God's body. He'll, he can only deal with mankind now that mankind is sinful and wicked. He can only deal with mankind through his body and through the Holy Spirit because sin cannot be in God the Father's presence. You have to go through the Holy Spirit or through Jesus Christ. And today you have to go through Jesus Christ to get the Holy Spirit. So you can go through the Holy Spirit to be able to pray and talk to God. When you stand, now that I'm saved, when I stand in God's presence, he, he sees my soul is clean and white clean because my soul is connected to Jesus Christ. He sees Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God. Okay. The perfect Lamb of God. But I'm trying to get into the Godhead a little bit more than I wanted to, but Lord God Almighty is a title for God. Okay. Lord God Almighty. It's all caps. Exodus 63, or I'm sorry, Exodus 6.3. If you want to turn to Exodus 6.3. And I appeared unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, okay, by the name of God Almighty. That's how, because we just read that in Genesis. By the name of God Almighty. But by the name Jehovah was I not known to them. Is Jehovah a title for God, a name for God? Absolutely. But am I saved by the name Jehovah? No, not today. Back then, at this time, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they were saved by the name God Almighty. They were saved by God Almighty. Then we get into Exodus. They're coming out of Egypt with Moses and everything. By the name Jehovah was I not known. So now they go, Jehovah saved us. God Almighty. God, the Father, saved them. Name Jehovah. Jehovah saved them. Absolutely. But today, we don't jump up and down. There's people that, like I said, they're doing everything they can to get away from the name Jehovah. Jesus. They don't want Jesus to save them. They want Jehovah to save them. They don't want Jesus to save them. They want Yeshua to save them. They don't, they, they don't want God manifest in the flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save them. And that's what it's all about. They're trying to find some, we already talked about this, they're trying to find some other way in, you know. There's only one way to heaven, but they're trying to find a back door. They're trying to find some other way in. They don't want to submit to Jesus Christ. But you have Jehovah yeah, in the Old Testament. I'm not saying Jehovah is not a title for God. It is. I didn't say Jehovah doesn't save. Jehovah saved a lot of people in the Old Testament, which is God, the Father. Through the angel of the Lord and through the Holy Spirit, man spake. and It says man in times past spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God saved people in the Old Testament through the angel of the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, and he was known as Jehovah. But today, he's known as Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. Mark 16, 9. Mark 16, 9. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. This is important. He sat on the right hand of God. Now turn to Revelation 11, 17. We want to talk about Almighty, Lord God Almighty. Revelation 11, 17, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty. There it is again, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which, which was, which, and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Some people can't, the, the Trinity people can't seem to grasp that. There's only one throne in heaven. When Jesus is sitting on the throne, you see Jesus, but God the Father is sitting on the throne, Jesus is sitting on the throne, the Holy Spirit is sitting on the throne. Jesus can get up on the throne and walk away, and God the Father is still sitting on the throne. How does that work? Great is the mystery of godliness. There's only one throne. Jesus is not sitting on God's lap. Okay, he's seated at the right hand of God. You know what it means to say right hand? That means he's with God. You ever heard that saying, my right hand man? He's my right hand man. In other words, he, 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 he's with me. He's loyal to me. He's, trust, he's my most trusted advisor. I trust him with my life. Jesus said at the right hand of God. Why? Because Jesus is God. That's the whole point of that saying, right hand. Jesus is God. 
But you want to talk about power, thy great power has reign. Jesus is going to rule and reign down here for a thousand years. It's called the day of the Lord, uh, the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes the kingdom of God can be a reference to kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom. And sometimes kingdom of God is a reference to the spiritual kingdom. you got to rightly divide 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay. But Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. We want to talk about Lord God Almighty. The Bible says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. We want to talk about Almighty. Okay. He's going to, he's, he, I tried, was talking with someone recently He said, well, he came, he came. When we read in Matthew 1, chapter 1 about his birth, he came as a lamb, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He came as the lamb of God. When he comes back, he's coming back as a roaring lion. Satan likes to copy Jesus. He really loves to copy Jesus. Okay? That's why Satan goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He likes to copy God. That's why Jesus is God. If Jesus was, some people say, well, Jesus just a prophet. If Jesus was a prophet, why would Jesus want to? Why would Satan want to copy a prophet? Satan doesn't want to be a prophet. Satan wants to be like the Most High. He wants to be God Almighty. Why is there so many things in this book where Satan's trying to counterfeit Jesus Christ? <coughs> because Jesus is God Almighty. The Lord God Almighty. Okay. So is that biblical? Yes. Check. That, that, that lines up with the scriptures. Next one. Wonderful Counselor. <coughs> Excuse me. Wonderful Counselor. Okay, this one's actually two titles that they put together in one for the hymn and make it sound like it's one title. It's a Wonderful Counselor. It's not. It's two different titles in the Bible. And we're going to talk about this. We have to separate them because they're not the same thing. When you look at the Wonderful, it's talking about... Um, getting ahead of myself, but we're talking about the acts of God, his, the works of God, His power that's shown down here. Okay? You're in wonder. You're in awe of God. That's what it means to be in awe and wonder. It's not you're sitting there going, ooh, he's so pretty. No, you're in awe. It's, it's a mix between fear and just amazement. Awe. Whoa. He just did that? That's what wonder is. And then counselor is we're supposed to seek the counsel of the Lord. We're going to get into this, okay? So, wonderful counsel. Where do you get those titles from? Isaiah 9.6 has a few titles that we're going to be going through, but Isaiah, we're going to be coming to back to Isaiah 9.6 a few times. So turn to Isaiah 9, chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. A child is born. This is, this is uh, prophesying Jesus Christ. So unto us a child is born. Talking about Jesus Christ. Unto us a son is given. Who's the us? The Jewish people. Okay, this is a prophecy for the Jewish people. But still, who's the, who's the Son? Jesus Christ. And the government shall be upon His shoulders. Who's the His? Jesus Christ. And His name shall be called. So now when we get here, we know that the His name is Jesus Christ. Not God the Father, the Son of God. But the Son's going to be born, the Son of God. So this is Jesus' titles that God the Father can share because they're one and the same. But this is addressed directing Jesus Christ. And his name shall be called Wonderful. There's a comma there. Wonderful. That's a title and a name all in itself. Wonderful. Counselor. That's separate. Okay. The Mighty God. We talked about that. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Everlasting Father. See, that one seems to stump a lot of people. Jesus, Jesus, uh, God the Son is not God the Father. Well, guess what? You're right. God the Son is not God the Father. Okay? There is no God the Son in the Scriptures. There's the Son of God. Of shows connection. That's why they have to change it, because if they say Son of God is not God the Father, then how can He be of God? You see how it's... Woo-hoo, woo-hoo, woo-hoo. He's not of God. So they got to take the of away and flip it over and say, God, the Son. Now they've made Jesus a separate God than the Father. 
But here, one of God's uh, Jesus' title is Everlasting Father. Jesus' title. Okay. They try to say, well, he's just a, a father of the nation of Israel and everything. See, they always try to explain it away. It's still a title for Jesus Christ. Is Jesus Christ a father of Israel apart from God the Father? See, that's what you hit them up with. They say yes, and they believe in two fathers. Two God the Fathers. Not just God the Son and God the Father. They believe in God the Father, God the Father, and God the Son, God the Father. It starts getting really mad. Why don't you just trust the Word and what it says what the Godhead is? Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He's the body. God the Father is the soul. The soul and the body are connected. Remember our condition, brother, says Christ. When we were lost, our bodies and souls were connected. When this body of flesh would sin, this body of flesh would sin, it tainted the soul. When the Bible says the wages of sin is death, when your body is sin, your soul is earning wages. And your soul, it's on its way to hell, and it deserves to go to hell for sinning against an almighty, righteous God. When we get saved, what happens? That spiritual circumcision made without hands. Our soul and our spirit are disconnected. Now when our flesh sins, it doesn't justify. Now we don't, you're not supposed to let your flesh just run rapid and sin all at once. Because I'm saved now, it can just sin all at once. That's not someone who's truly saved. Someone who's truly saved, they came to God broken. Their attitude towards sin is, I hate sin, I hate wickedness, I want to please God. Letting my flesh run rampant doesn't please God. Okay. But the point is, when your flesh sins now as a saved sinner, it doesn't taint your soul. Because they're not one. God the Father, the soul, and Jesus Christ, the body, are one. Why is that so hard for some people? Jesus was perfect. Jesus took on the sins of the world. He became sin who knew no sin. He was perfect. He never sinned in his life. That's how God the Father and the Son could stay connected. Jesus is the body's perfect. He was the perfect Lamb of God, which we're going to get into. But I just, it's going off a little bit on a tangent there, on the, the Everlasting Father, okay? The Everlasting Father. It's a title for Jesus referring to God the Father. He's God the Father. And people will attack this and say, no, that's not that what that means. That they're one and the same. They're connected. They're one. When Jesus speaks, God the Father speaks. It's speaking. When I speak, it's me speaking. Some men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I can relay words from God the Father through the Holy Ghost to you. But it's still me speaking to you, relaying the word. Jesus isn't relaying the word. When Jesus speaks, it is God Almighty, God the Father, speaking to you, to the people. When he was born, he came. Where's Jesus right now? He's in heaven preparing a place for us. He's seated at the right hand of God. Right now we have the Holy Spirit in us. And God, the Father, speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. But we see here, wonderful, get back to the title we're talking about right now, is the Wonderful and Counselor. We're going to split them up and we're going to talk about wonderful. I already mentioned wonderful has to do with the acts of God, the power of God in display on this earth, all right, among creation. Uh, Psalms, turn to Psalms 107. We're going to go to, a, we're just going to skip through a few verses in Psalms 107. It's a good psalm. 107 verse 8, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, the blessings he gives people, his mercy, that's goodness, his mercy, his blessings, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And there's an exclamation point. I just, I'm just going to dry throat this morning. I'm not going to scream it. But this has an exclamation point on it. It's them yelling it. It's, it's passionate. Okay. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works in the children of men. You know, generations had the tendency that the generation that God did that wonderful work in, they would be like praising God. But then the next generation would kind of die down a little bit, not praise him as much. And then the next generation, and it'd get to a generation where they don't praise God anymore. King David's like, we need to keep praising God. 
And, and you go through the Psalms, he talks about the wonderful works of God where he brought him out of Egypt. This is like genera a few generations before King David's time. King David's getting back to saying, we still need to give God glory and God praise for all the wonderful works that he did. Okay. He brought him out of Egypt. He saved him. Okay. We're going to get into Jesus Christ here in a second, but with the wonderful works that Jesus Christ did. But in the past, God did amazing things. You know, pillar of fire. We talked about this. Pillar of fire at night, smoke during the day. Could you imagine that? Would you be sitting there over the tabernacle? Would you be sitting there looking at that and just being in awe going, whoa. How, how, how often do you read about the flood? Now, there's times I've caught myself where I just read it casually. How, time do you, how many times do you stop and go, whoa. That had to have been a sight to see. The fountains of the deep exploding. First time you've ever seen rain. We take rain for granted, but that's the first time they ever saw rain. Jump down to verse 15, what, Psalms 107, 15. It says again, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Jesus came to the Jewish people. They kept saying, show us a sign, show us a sign. He was healing people. He healed a blind man that was born blind, which we're going to talk about. He was healing people. He walked on water. He raised people from the dead. Show us a sign, show us a sign. Uh, so jump down to 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. God's going to pour out his wonder in the time of Jacob's trouble. This is wrath, but they're going to see a lot of wonder from the Lord in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Today, it's a wonderful, when someone gets saved, it's wonderful. When God saves someone today, especially in my time, I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about all the way back, the church age, they call it the church age, but the time of Gentiles, from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul, the uh, gospel is revealed to Paul for us today, and from that point on to today, when someone got saved, it, it's, it's, they call it a miracle, but it's wonderful. It's the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But in these last days, someone who gets saved today, we have a wonderful God, don't we? He has the power. How, how often do you... The Bible says every angel, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but they, cel they, they, they celebrate and praise God over one soul that repenteth, one soul that gets saved. How often do we go... Or how often are we in awe, brothers and sisters Christ, when we, we hear a testimony from someone who got saved? I think we're starting to lose that awe, don't you, brother says Christ? We're starting to lose that awe, that that being in wonder, looking at the Lord in wonder. He's wonderful. Jump down to 31, verse 31. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Now we're talking about his wonder, but, but it says here, for his goodness. Do you take his uh, blessings for granted? The blessings that God gives you. Some people try to mistake a blessing for a miracle. It's a miracle. No, it's not a miracle. It's a blessing. There's miracles and there are blessings. How do I say this to a brother in Christ? A blessing can be a miracle. When a miracle happens, you are blessed by it. But not all miracles are blessings. I hope I'm saying this right. All mir a miracle can be a blessing, but bl not all blessings are miracles. I'll say it like that. Not all blessings are miracles. But they're two separate things. Okay? A blessing is something God does for you. A miracle is God doing something, showing His power, showing His grace, showing His mercy, showing His anger, showing His wrath, showing His might, the mighty God. A miracle is something that God is showing His power among men where we sit there and we look and we're in awe. Wow, did you just see that? Jesus just healed that man that was born blind. Oh, did you just see that? He just raised that man from the dead. Who is that? There's, there's a ghost. There's, a, there's some kind of ghost and spirit on the water. 
Be not afraid, it is I. He's talking about Jesus walking on water. You had the disciples in there, and Peter's like, whoa. And all of them are like, wow, he's walking on water. They're in wonder, they're in awe. The wonderful works of Jesus Christ. He healed people. He preached truth to people. I know we're going over a lot of the healings, but he preached truth to them. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was there to give them life, true life. When you get truly saved and born again, for those of us who are truly saved and born again, we have true life. We now know what true peace is. And we're going to get into that Prince of Peace. We now know what true peace is, what real life is, what it means to actually live. We were created by our God, Lord and God and Savior, the Godhead, God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Holy Spirit. We were created by the Godhead, our God. We're here to please Him. We now know what it really means to live. He came to give life, brothers and sisters in Christ. Are we starting to forget who it is that saved us and who it is that we are living for? Are you? Am I? Are we starting to lose that awe? How, when's the last time you were in prayer and, and the, 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 the gospel came up and you started remembering who you were before you got saved and that God saved you and you're on your knees in tears and in awe of what God did for you? I'm not saying you have to do that every single day, but there are days, brothers and Christ, there are days that I'm still hitting my knees and just praising God and thanking Him for saving me. He didn't have to. We talked about for salvation, the whosoever clause. In the lost world, they're always trying to find back doors or finding ways to force God into saving. God didn't have to save me. He didn't have to. He didn't have to save you, brothers and Christ. How many of you are so thankful, so grateful, and in awe of the power of God, the gospel? Or how many of you have gotten complacent? It's just got become casual with the gospel, become casual with the word of God, become casual with what God did for you. How many of you are still in awe? Some of us need to get back into awe. That's why, I, I, like I said, I think it builds up in me. It builds up over time, and every once in a while, I just fall on my knees, and, remember, and it's like I need to be back in awe of what God did for me, saving me. There's times, in, He didn't just save me eternally. There's times down here, brothers and sisters, Christ, that He's saving me in this life. Okay, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In this life, I'm making mistakes, and God's saving me from them. I'm failing the Lord, and I'm falling flat on my face, and I just look, and God just is saving me from it. How'd you do it, Lord? I, I can't see how you did it. I'm in awe of your wonder, your goodness, your blessings, your saving grace. Psalms 111.4 he hath made his wonderful works to be rec remembered. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. Brothers and Christ, why do we stay in the word of God? Why do we preach the gospel among saved? Why do we talk about the gospel among saved sinners? Because uh, for two reasons. A, there are some uh, false converts, wolves in sheep's coat and snake, that are sneaking in among the flock and we're preaching the gospel hoping that they might get saved. But I'm saying among saved sinners, why do we keep preaching it? He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. We need to remember. There's some brethren that have forgotten the God of their salvation. They've forgotten the God of the King James Bible. They've forgotten the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They've forgotten the gospel of the King James Bible. They've gotten so messed up in the world and the flesh. What are the three enemies, brothers and Christ? Do you remember what the three enemies are? Satan, the world, and the flesh, your flesh. Those are going to be your three greatest enemies. And they pull you away and you start forgetting the God of your salvation. Receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Those three enemies are always going to try to pull you away from this and keep you from this. Keep you from doing things God's way. Keep you from being remembering His wonderful works. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Right? The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Do you remember that? Do you honor that? Are you in awe of that? Are you starting to take it for granted? Nah, I'm saved. 
I'm sealed into the day of redemption. Nah. No, I'm, I, my, my soul might be saved into the day of redemption, but this body isn't. My soul and spirit are, but this body isn't. I might be sealed into the day of redemption, but am I taking it for granted? Well, I don't want to get into this too much now, but there's another study we'll get into about uh, are you looking, and we're going to get into liberty again a little bit, but are you taking your liberty that you have in Christ Jesus, are you taking it for granted? Are you using it as an occasion for the flesh? Are you taking what Jesus Christ did for you for granted? Are you taking the things, the miracles, the wonderful works of Jesus Christ, the wonderful works of God in the Old Testament, the time of Jacob's trouble? We won't be here for it, but the, the, what God, the works that God performs in the time of Jacob's trouble. Are you starting to lose that awe? John chapter 9, verse 1. Turn to John chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? I have to stop there for a second. Okay, that his parents, that he was born blind. Today you have men blaming God. Okay? This is called, this is, when I read this, I'm not laughing at it, but it's, it's, it makes me think, you know, the world, the first thing they try to do is they blame God. If someone's born blind, they blame God, and they want to curse God, you know. They want to blame God. But here they are, they're blaming the parents, and they're blaming the man. I mean, before he's even born, they're blaming the man, you know. Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God was to blame. Not blame like he's at fault. Please understand. I understand that's what the word blame is. But I'm just saying, they didn't give God the credit. They didn't say God did this. They were saying, it was, you know, it, it was the man's fault. It was, it was the, the parent's fault. No, God did it for a reason. That's what Jesus is saying. God did it for a reason. Let him that the works of God should be made, made, works of God made manifest in him. This is, like I said, this is one of those times where it was God. This is all God. Now, he's not at fault like he's an error. Please, please understand that. But I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, instead of giving God the credit, did God do this? They're saying it must have been the wife, the, the, God did this to him because it's their fault, not God did this because he's got a reason. They're not, you know, anyway. I might be going too wrong with it, but the point is I was reading this was like, they're, they're blaming everybody else and they're not giving God the glory and God the credit. Okay? It's everyone else's fault. But Jesus says no, and so the wonderful works of God may be manifest. Verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And we're going to get into that one a little bit later. Light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. Okay, the pool of Siloam, they had different pools. And you read the story, one of the pools, an angel would come down and trouble the water, and the first person to get in the pool would be instantly healed. Because that was one of the pools. I can't remember if it's the pool of Siloam, if it's the pool of, of uh, I want to say, I can't pronounce it in my head. I kind of like, almost like you have the word in your head. Um, but go wash at the pool of Siloam, which be interpreted sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? They questioned on who it was over the fact that he could see. I mean, you look at him, same clothes, <clears throat> same body, but because he could see, is this, the, is this the man? Because God performed a miracle, he did a wonderful work. Is this the man? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they to him, how were thine eyes opened? Here's the wonderful works of God. This is why he was born blind. He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. 
a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received sight. The Jews require a what? A sign. The Greeks seek that for wisdom, but the Jews require a sign. It was so the wonderful works of God can be wrought in this man. These guys at first, instead of being at awe, oh, wow, awe, oh, you can see, how is this possible? They doubted who the man was. Ah, oh, it's not the man. Ah, oh, nothing like that would ever really happen. That, that's not the man. What happened to being in awe? Then you keep reading the whole story about him. He goes, they get, they pull him towards uh, to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, you know, end up throwing him out. This isn't a miracle. Give God the glory. This is God. Jesus is God. Why aren't you giving God the glory? That's what I'd, I'd probably been stoned. But why did Jesus is God? Why aren't you giving God the glory? You have people that do that today, brother, sis, Christ. They try to take the the glory from Jesus Christ and give it to a lowercase g God, Yeshua. Yahashua. Okay. The Trinity, God the Son, a separate God, lowercase g God. They take glory from Jesus Christ. Why aren't they giving Jesus Christ the glory? Because they don't believe he's God. Truly, capital G, God, the Father, the one true God. To us, there's but one God, the Father. There's only one God. Remember, there's one God. And one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The only way Jesus can be God is if he's God the Father. Why aren't they giving him glory? Because they don't want to give God the glory. They want them to give, what they're really saying, the Pharisees, when they say give God the glory, what they're really saying is they want the glory. Because they're the religious leaders. They want you, you got to give God the glory through us. And you see that a lot in this organized religions around here. You gotta give God the glory through us. You gotta pray to God through us. I mean, you got Catholicism where you have all these pagan gods that are that are replaced by all these so-called saints, and you have to pray. You have to pray through everybody. Pray through Mary, a fake Mary. It's not the real Mary of the, the King James Bible. It's a, it's a it's Satan. You pray through everyone else to God and give God glory through them. That's what they really wanted. Okay. God, Jesus worked this miracle for the people. It was a wonder. They should have been in awe. It should have helped them turn to Jesus. But the moment they started turning to Jesus, they got the whisper. Remember the three enemies, Satan, their flesh, the world. Tried to pull them away. One minute you have them saying, Hosanna in the highest. Getting a little ahead of myself. Next minute they're saying, crucify him. Why? Because the enemy corrupted him. The three enemies. Jesus did many wonderful things in his earthly ministry, but the greatest thing he did, we read about, we talked about a lot of great wonders that Jesus did. Walking on water. He, he raised people from the dead. Lazarus, uh, the widow's son. Okay? He healed a lot of people. He walked on water. But more importantly, he was preaching truth and there to give him life. But the greatest miracle, the greatest thing that God had did for us, turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I believe the greatest miracle, the greatest wonderful work of God. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which all was also in Christ Jesus. It's also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Equal means the same. If you've ever done math, when you say 2 plus 2 equals um, 2 times 2, they're saying they're both the same. They both equal the same. You come up with the same number, 4. 2 plus 2 is 4, 2 times 2 is 4. Four is the answer, and it's equal. So when you say you're equal, you're the same. They're the same. And math is considered the same equation. They both amount to the same number. Okay. I'm not trying to get into math too much, but you know, there's a lot of things about math. They, they try to figure out 50 different ways to do the same equation. And it's the same, it's the same, it's the same. It's equal, it's equal, it's equal. That's what equal means. It's the same. That's what equal means. The same. You can say two plus two, or you can say four. It's the same. 
Okay. But anyway, just throw a little math out there. Robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. God gave up his incorruptible body. God the Father gave up his incorruptible body in the Old Testament for a corruptible one. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him a form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The likeness of sinful flesh. He gave up his incorruptible body to come to earth in the likeness of sinful flesh, knowing the people didn't know, but he knew he'd have to die on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. People didn't know, but he knew. Verse 8, And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Obedient unto death. The greatest wonderful work that God has ever done is sacrificing His Son on the cross that you, brothers and sisters of Christ, and I could go to heaven, have our sins washed away, have our relationship with God repaired so we can walk with God, so now that we can be the sons of God, that we can live a life of Christ and spend eternity serving God and serving one another. It's the greatest wonder that Jesus ever did, that God ever did. He did so many wonders, that was the greatest one. How many people are in awe of that, brother, sister, in Christ? <laughs> you look at this world, not many. Not many. And we're back, brother, sister, Christ. Um, just wanted to switch it around a little bit, just in case the sun was putting glare on the, the camera and everything. Um, but let's keep up with the, the study. We've got a long way still to go. <laughs> Counsel. Okay? We just talked about the wonderful. That's a title for God. Wonderful. What about counselor? Okay, we, hopefully we're learning from each one of these two on how we're supposed to treat God. Okay? Wonderful. Are you in awe? We just talked about that. The Lord God Almighty. Is Jesus Christ your Lord God Almighty? Is He God fully and completely? Are you treating Him as a Lord? As God? as a mighty person, all-powerful. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now we're going to talk about the counsel, counselor. Okay, he's called a counselor as a title. Joshua chapter 9, verse 14. Joshua chapter 9, verse 14. And the men took of their victuals and asked not the counsel of the mouth of the Lord. They asked not counsel the mouth of the Lord. And you talk and you read the whole story about Joshua. What happened was is he was supposed to kick everybody out of that land, all the Gentiles, if you want to say Gentiles, but the heathens, out of the land that was promised to them by the Lord. The Lord commanded that they were to drive them, drive them out or slaughter them all. But they're not to remain in that land. Okay. And you had a group of them that saw that feared God and saw the, the one true God. And saw the wonderful his wonderful works that he wrought among the Israel, the Jews, and they paraded themselves as being from a far country. And they came and they deceived Joshua and deceived the princes of Israel, and they made a covenant with them, thinking that they were people from a far country, and they lived right they lived they were next door, living on that land that was promised to them by God. And how were they deceived? They took not the counsel of the mouth of the Lord. They didn't take the counsel. They didn't seek the God's counsel. You know how we're deceived a lot, brothers and Christ, today? We don't seek the counsel of the Lord. How do you seek the counsel of the Lord? Do you know this book like you should know this book? Or do you have the attitude of, this is my foundation, chapter and verse? When you start to put this to the side, you become respecter of persons. You get lazy. You start uh, compromising, over, I'll overlook it because it's him. That's respect to a person's. He's doing it, I'll, I'll overlook it. You start fainting, you start faltering, you start compromising. And the next thing you know, you can be deceived. And you get deceived. We're supposed to seek the counsel of the Lord. One of his titles is counselor. Joshua didn't. 
he failed the Lord. First Chronicles ten thirteen. Turn to First Chronicles ten thirteen. So there you have an example where they were supposed to, were supposed to be they were supposed to be seeking the counsel of the Lord, and they failed. Oh, I got this. I can handle this. I can do this. I know what I'm doing. How often do you seek the counsel of the Lord on everything in your life? Lord, do you talk to him, pray, say, Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, what do you think about that? Is this what you want for me? It might not be a sin, but is this what you want for me? Are you seeking the counsel of the Lord in every aspect of your life? Or do you stand up and say, I got this. No, don't worry. I got this. I, I know what I'm doing. I got this. I can handle this. Lord, you just sit back and just, you know, chill out, Lord. Chill out. I got this. And what happens? You trip and fall flat on your face. Joshua fell flat on his face. The, the princes of Israel fell flat on their face. They didn't seek the counsel of the Lord. First Chronicles 10.3 so Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. Now, what's the difference between Saul and King David? When Saul failed the Lord and didn't keep his word, he had pride and got uh, uh, puffed up, tried to justify it. Remember, we talked about this in other studies, brothers and Christ, but... Samuel came to Saul saying, what's the bleeding of these sheep in my ears? He was commanded to wipe those people out completely, including the animals. Wipe everything out. Kill King Hagag. And when he said, I have done the work, I have, I've obeyed the commandment of God. So, so Samuel's like, what's the bleeding of these cheese sheep in my ears? Well, I have kept the commandment of God. These, these sheep are for a sacrifice to the Lord. It, it just, his pride and ego, he couldn't humble himself. He was against the word of the Lord. It wasn't that, like King David, what's the difference? King David, he failed the Lord. He committed adultery and then tried to, tried to fool God even. He tried to have the man come back and lie with his wife so they'll think that, the, that Bathsheba's child was Uriah the Hittite's child. Okay? He wanted to deceive the people, and he was trying to deceive God. He failed miserably. Then when that deception didn't work, he had the man killed. But when it, he was confronted by Nathan the prophet, Saul was confronted by Samuel the prophet. Saul's attitude was puffed up and prideful. What was King David's attitude? He humbled himself. I sinned against God. I did wrong against God. That's the difference. Right? Neither man kept God's word, but he humbled himself. Right? He humbled himself. Saul never humbled himself. He kept getting more and more prideful and more puffed up. And his sins got worse. And his defiance against God got worse. King David sung, and we talk about that, he sung in the hymns, his heart was for the will of God. His heart was for the Lord. Saul's wasn't. But the part that we're talking for this, the next verse in the line says, And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Those are the two big transgressions that he did. He wouldn't keep the word of the Lord. He would try to change the word of the Lord, and then he rejected the word of the Lord. He also sought counsel, if you know the story, of a familiar spirit. He inquired of it. Because God wasn't speaking to him. He was holding iniquity in his heart. Remember what King David said in the Psalms. If I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. You know the number one thing that hinders the prayers of the saints to this very day. Going all the way back to King David and before King David. You know the number one thing that hinders a walk with the Lord, fellowship with the Lord, prayer. You holding sin in your heart. Not that you committed sin. We're all, I'm a saved sinner, brothers and sisters. I still make mistakes. I'm a saved sinner. This is talking, Paul, uh, Paul, King David, when he wrote the psalm, he's talking about holding in your heart like Saul did. What? I didn't do anything wrong. Do you know people like that today? Men that I believe are saved, 
and lost people do it a lot, but I know men that are saved that they're holding iniquity in their heart and their pride and their ego won't allow them to, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I failed you. Lord, I was wrong. Their pride won't let them do it. They're holding that iniquity in their heart. That's what it means to hold iniquity in your heart. You're not letting go of it. You're trying to justify it. You're trying to change the Word of God to justify it. That was Saul. That wasn't King David. Are you a Saul, brother, sister, Christ? Are you a King David? How are you reacting to sin? Okay, when you fail to keep the word of the Lord, when you, when you fail the Lord, when you fail the brethren, when you fail the lost world, because remember, we're supposed to be a light to this world. If you start acting like the world, looking like the world, you start compromising to please the world, you're failing them. He asked counsel of the familiar spirits to inquire of it. God wasn't hearing him because he refused to fall on his knees and repent and say, I'm sorry, Lord. I have wronged you. I have failed you, Lord. I am sorry. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He refused to do that. He refused to humble himself like King David did. But he sought the counsel of the wrong person. So you have Joshua who didn't seek counsel of the Lord. I've got this. You got Saul seeking the counsel from the wrong people, and that's what we see out there in the world today. We see people who, who they're, they're on my own counsel. I got it. I'll do things my way. I know what's right. I know what's best. They're doing things their way. You got people that are being deceived. Remember, the, uh, the, uh, Satan is transformed into an angel of light. And no marvel, for his ministers also transformed into ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You got people out there being deceived. Come to me for counsel. Satan's, Satan's ministers, come to me for counsel. Oh, there is no perfect written word of God out there. Oh, who's to say what's right and wrong? Come to me, I'll tell you what's right and wrong. Brother and sister Christ, this ministry is Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries. If you fear God, you're going to believe this book. And in believing this book, you're fearing God. They go hand in hand. That's why I called it that. If you don't fear God, you're not going to believe this book, the King James Bible. You're going to be seeking counsel from yourself. Yea, hath God said, you're going to be the final authority. Some man behind a pulpit, you're going to trust him to be the final authority. Or some man behind the camera. I'm not the final authority, brother, sister Christ. God is, through his perfect written word. This is the final authority that you can hold me accountable to, and I can hold you accountable to. We have the same standard. We're on the same page. Paul said that we're supposed to be of the same mind and of the same judgment, striving together. Why are we doing that? Because people are forgetting that this is our final authority. People are forgetting that God is the one who's supposed to seek the counsel through, through His Word, by the Holy Spirit, through His Word. They're falling into the counsel of men that aren't Jesus Christ. Amen. Isaiah 55, 6, we read, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now, ultimately, I believe when it says while he is near, why he may be found, you say, what, is he going away? No. Brothers is Christ, when a man or woman dies in unbelief, dies in their sin, they go to hell. And when you go to hell, at that point, there is no seeking the Lord. While he may, because you, won't, you won't, won't be able to find him. You won't be able to call upon him. By then, it's too late. That's why we teach the world. Like I said, don't let the world down. Preach truth to them. Preach Jesus Christ to them. Live a life of Christ that shines and says, I'm not like you. Do you want to be like me? I've had people get saved that way. They're like, what do you have that I don't have? How do you have this peace and I don't have that peace? How do you have this real joy and I don't have that joy? You're content and I'm not. How, do you, how can you be so content? It's because Jesus is in me. And he preached Jesus Christ to him. It's not me, it's Jesus Christ. 
don't think it's me, it's Jesus Christ. And you preach Jesus Christ to them. But they need to see that light too. You don't just speak the light, they need to see the light. Okay? But it's blessed. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Brother and sister Christ, we're supposed to be seeking God and seeking his counsel. We're supposed to be doing things his way. A big division got brought in among the body of Christ, I did with the brother in Christ, but, and the biggest division, the reason why, is because he wasn't wanting to do things God's way. Not that our disagreement, he has to agree with me 100%. He wasn't doing things God's way, and because he wasn't doing things God's way, he, a few of them, were causing division in the body of Christ. The Bible says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. No, I'm not going to use meekness, I'm going to use pride and bitterness, and I'm going to use name-calling and mocking and railing for railing, and bearing false witness, and attacking men personally. You see what I'm saying? You seek the counsel of the Lord so you don't make those mistakes. Lord, I'm having a problem with this brother in Christ. How do I deal with them? And the Bible tells us how we deal with them. One of the biggest things, I don't want to go off too much on a tangent, but one of the biggest things I see happening today, the easiest way for them to do it, the Bible says you have to deal with them with love and meekness, brotherly love and meekness, and it's hard, Brother Christ, it's hard, and it can hurt sometimes. But you're getting some men out there that are getting lazy and becoming cowards, and instead of loving and doing things the hard way and loving their brothers and sisters in Christ, and doing things God's ways in meekness, trying to reach them for the truth, they just think they found a shortcut. I'll just say they're not saved. And I'll treat them like they're lost. The Bible says if you've sinned against the brethren, you've sinned against Christ. That's just one situation. We have division over people won't give in to the Godhead because they refuse to seek the counsel of the Lord when it comes to the Godhead. When it comes to the true plan of salvation, when it comes to eternal security, when it comes to the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, which includes his eminent return, looking, present tense, in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. We're supposed to be looking for Jesus coming with the life that we're living every day. Are you ready? If Jesus came back today, are you ready? That's how you're supposed to live. But you've got brethren who said, I don't care about the counsel of the Lord, I'm going to turn my back on the eminent return of Jesus Christ. You got people starting to act like Saul. Are you going to act like Saul or are you going to act like King David? King David fell on his knees and sought the Lord. After he sinned and everything, he fell on his knees. He was on the, the earth in ashes seeking the Lord. Psalm 16 7, we read, turn to Psalm 16 7. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in, nights, in the night season. But the part there is, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. Sometimes God's not always... Here's the thing, brother. Sir, God's not always going to tell you what you want to hear. He's going to tell you what you need to hear. And you need to still be saying, Bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. You think it's a, some, so this world thinks it's a bad thing. God's always telling me what to do. God's always telling me what to do. Praise the Lord. Those of us who are saved, brother says Christ, praise the Lord. Because if God wasn't telling me everything I'm supposed to do, I'd be a complete mess. I'd be a complete wreck. Psalms 33, 11. And every time I stray from this, you know, you put this down. I mean, there's nothing wrong with putting it down, but when you, say, when you say you put this down, in other words, you go without reading it for a while. When we say you put this down, what happens? You start straying from the Lord. You start taking your eyes off the Lord. Your flesh starts getting the better of you. The world starts getting the better of you. Satan starts getting the better of you. When you put that down, you stop seeking the counsel of the Lord. You stop hiding God's word in your heart. Psalms 33, 11. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart are to all generations. The Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Three times in the four Gospels. The Bible talks about in Psalms, 
I will praise thy name for thy loving kindness and magnify thy truth for thou hast elevated thy word above all thy name. I might have messed it up, but the last part, I, God has elevated his word above his name. I will praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. All thy name. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. God's word has always been there. In the beginning was the capital W word, the manifest word. You know, when Jesus speaks, it's God speaking. God's word's always been there. His counsel. Now, with what we're talking about here, you go back to Adam and Eve. Why didn't, why didn't Eve seek the counsel of God? Satan was telling him her something that was total contradiction to what God was saying. Why didn't Eve, Eve ate, let's say Eve failed to do it, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she went to give to her husband? Why didn't Adam seek the counsel of the Lord? Should I do this? I, I don't want to lose my wife. Should I do this? Why didn't he seek the counsel of the Lord? His word was there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why do you seek the counsel of the Lord? Something to think about. Proverbs 19.21 There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. You know the laws of God are written on every man's heart? That shall stand. Nobody's without excuse. Okay. I was uh, listening to a song and it was kind of worldly and I came across it as far as the beat. But I, I, sometimes I look at the words because that's what I care about is the words. Okay. I, I, I understand I don't listen to the song because if the, the beat, let's say the rhythm is equal to your heart rate or faster, it's fleshly. Or if it's got a beat, bump, bump bump that kind of shakes you a little bit because if you haven't listened to that type of music which I haven't when you come across one it's supposed to be a hymn but when you come across one and you just even if it's like there was one that was like thump thump it made me jump almost every time it thumped it's like because your flesh is not used to it anymore you've, 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 you've put in the flesh down but it talks about in the end um, everyone talks to God and at first I was like no, only people who are saved can talk to God. But I got to thinking, and I got to praying about it, talking to the Lord about it, because I love talking to the Lord about everything, seeking the counsel of the Lord. And it's like, you know what? That is actually true. Because every, in, the, in the end, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every tongue is going to confess what? That Jesus is Lord. They're going to be speaking to God Almighty, who they claimed wasn't God the Father. Jesus is not God the Father. It's not Jesus. It's, it's Yeshua. It's not Jesus. It's whatever. They're going to be standing before Jesus, and they're going to say, Jesus is Lord, before they're thrown in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Even the lost world is going to talk to God someday. Amen. Right. His counsel of the Lord shall stand. Now remember about man's heart. The, the imagination of man's heart is only weak, wicked, evil, or only evil continually. Okay? That's why we, are, we that are saved, brothers and Christ, we hide this in our heart so it pushes out the wickedness and the sin. The flesh saying, this is okay, that's okay. No, no, no. I've got this in my heart now. It says that's wrong. I'm not doing it. It says I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be reading my Bible every day. I'm supposed to be uh, praying every day. I'm supposed to abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. I'm supposed to be looking present tense for that blessed hope. We hide God's word in our heart so it pushes that junk out. But you know what's in your heart to begin with? The laws of God are written on every man's heart. And what's the laws of God for? They're a schoolmaster to bring everybody to Christ. There's not one person that can stand out there and say, I never was given the chance to come to Christ. Oh, yes, you were. Oh, yes, you were. Okay. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. 
Now, so I don't have to turn here, but Psalms 119.11. Hopefully you, some of you brethren are getting this one memorized. Psalms 119.11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, there's another psalm that uh, talks about um, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. How do we walk according to thy word? The counsel of the Lord. Now some people think counsel is just him saying, well, he tells us what we could do. Because some people try to say this is just a guide. This, the Bible all the Bible, they're just a guide. You know, you can choose to keep it. Yeah, God give us free will so you have that part. But they're saying, the Bible's saying it's just a guide. And, and it's just, you know, it's just a suggestion. When God counsels, it's not a suggestion. It's the right way. It's the truth. It's a command. Once again, the, the, the so-called professing Christian of today can't handle a God that commands them. They like having that choice. They like having that freedom to do whatever they want, whenever they want. They can't handle a God that commands them. The counsel of the God, God will say, this is the right way, take it or leave it. This is what you need to do, period. Take it or leave it. When we're saved, you know, I'm talking about for the Old Testament, but I always tell people, what's the difference between, I think it was counseling or... I forgot the other word. It had to do like therapy where you're going in all the time. I said the difference was is one, you're going in all the time. You never get fixed. You never get told what exactly to do to fix your problem. It's just you're going in all the time. True counsel is is you come in with a problem and you tell that person, here's the solution. Now I'm done. I've told you what to do. It's up to you to do it. That's what counsel is. Okay, that's how God is. God will say, here's how to do it. It's up to you, brother and sister Christ, to do it. It's up to you, brother and sister Christ, to do it. Psalms 119, uh, go down to 114. I, I said you didn't have to turn there, but 114. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. You know, when everything's falling apart, brother and sister Christ, what do you do? You get into God's word. You get into prayer. You sing hymns. Hymns that oftentimes are word for word from the Bible. That come from the Bible. That's why we're doing this, going through a hymn to see if it actually comes from the Bible, God's Word. What's supposed to give us hope? God's Word. His promises. When I fall flat on my face and I fail the Lord, what, what's the first thing you do when you're making a comeback, Brother Sis Christ? Let's say you've you fell into temptation, you start getting into sin and wickedness, or the world tempts you and pulls you away and you compromise, or, God, uh, God, I hope this never happens, God forbid, that you ever listen to Satan, but those are the three enemies that will pull you away, and you start failing the Lord for a while. When you fall on your knees, you come broken again, and you fall on your knees and you repent. What's the first thing you've got to get back into hardcore? This and prayer. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Romans 11.34 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? There's one meter between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is there to reconcile mankind to God the Father. Acts 20.27 20, we read, for I have, not shun, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Who's God's counselor? Jesus Christ was God's counselor. The Holy Spirit's God's counselor. The Holy Spirit showed Paul the counsel of God to share with the brethren. So, counselor is a title for all three. All three. Ephesians 1.11. Turn to Ephesians 1.11. And whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we shall be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. 
I'll say that again, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. When you trust in Christ, you're after the counsel of His own wills, Him that worketh all things. Not just in word, but in deed, worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. When you're in Christ Jesus, our Lord, it's going to show by the work that you do. You're about the will of the Lord. You love His will. You love His commandments. Got into this with, uh, I, pr I pray she's a sister in Christ, but a woman online, and she can't seem to get that. She thinks it's just a choice, and it's something we should do, and it is something we should do, and it is a choice, but she can't seem to bring it to understand that it's not a suggestion. It's a command. When God commands, we're supposed to obey. No, no, it's not a command. God wouldn't command us. In other words, she's not a servant of Jesus Christ. She's not a bond servant of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Know ye not that ye are not your own? You were bought with a price. Feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. When you get saved and you're in Christ Jesus, you belong to God. But she's part of that worldliness that, Oh, we're just all equal. Even Jesus, Jesus and us, we're all, in God, we're all equal. If God is God, we're not equal. I'm not God. I'm not even close to God. Not even. Without Jesus Christ here, without His Word here, the Holy Spirit here, I'd be so messed up. But they're still trying to bring Jesus down to our level and make Him like He's just one of us. Now, He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, but Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He's God Almighty. He commands, we obey. Brothers, is Christ in your life? Is Jesus becoming a best pal, a pal, a friend that he, when he sits next to you, you can just hit him on and say, hey, how's it going, Jesus? Is that how Jesus is becoming to you? Or is Jesus King of kings and Lord of lords? Is he your master? I say a, a commander-in-chief, because I was in the military, commander-in-chief. But is he your master? Is he your capital L Lord? Remember Abraham and uh, Sarah, Sarah calling Abraham my Lord, saying, in other words, she was under the head covering and authority of Abraham. I know the feminists don't like that, but that's what the Bible's saying. Is Jesus your capital L Lord? Is he your capital K King? Is he God Almighty? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Are you treating Jesus like he's God Almighty, a king? A king commands, you obey. If you don't obey, there's consequences. A lord, a lord of a land. When they command and lay down the law, when they command, you break the law, you fail to keep those commandments, there's, pun there's consequences. No, 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 I don't treat Jesus like that. He's a buddy. He makes some, some good suggestions that sound good sometimes, but I, I, I got my own way, and I do my own thing. How are you treating Jesus Christ, brothers and Christ? We see how the world, we're, we're getting so upset and we're getting so disgusted by the fake Jesus of this world and how the world truly treats the real Jesus Christ of Scripture, the real Son of God, the real Jesus Christ, who is God the Father manifest in the flesh. And we look at this wicked world and we see how they treat their Jesus and then they go, well, that Jesus isn't like my Jesus. Uh, yeah, you're right. This Jesus is God Almighty. He's a king. He's not your best pal. This Jesus Christ has a zero tolerance for sin. Does your Jesus, the, the Jesus of their world, they love, has, he loves sin. So he's okay with sin. And I can go on and on and on. Uh -huh. But the Counselor, Brother and Sister Christ, we seek the counsel of the Lord. Right? The counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Now I'm going to, uh, we still got a lot of pages to go, but I'm going to stop right here for this part, and we'll continue, and we'll just make a part three. I just, I just need to stop doing videos that are like super, super long. Uh, I want to try to make shorter videos, even if that means making multiple parts. But, Brother and Sister Christ, I hope this is an encouragement to you. 
my prayer for you, brother, sister, Christ, through all of this is make sure that you're being a Berean and you're checking the scriptures daily to see if those things are so and that you're staying in the word daily and you're hiding God's word in your heart and you're living it. You're staying in prayer daily, praying for the brethren, praying for your own walk with the Lord, praying for the brethren and their walk with the Lord, praying for the brethren when it comes to this wicked world, protection when it comes to this wicked world, praying for the brethren when it comes to strength, to stand in this wicked world. Remember, we're supposed to do all to stand Stand, stand, stand. Don't faint. Don't falter. Remember, we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment. We're supposed to be striving together. The body of Christ desperately needs prayer in these last days. Uh, men in ministry desperately need prayer in these last days. Hey, okay, brothers says Christ. Uh, thank you for following along for this Bible study. So far, everything that's in the song has lined up with the scriptures. All these titles are there. Okay? Be careful. We talked about some where there's some titles that people try to use and names for God that aren't in the Scripture. Trinity is not a title for God, nor is it a description of God in the, in the Scriptures. So if it didn't come from God, where did it come from? If it didn't come from His Word, where did it come from? Yeshua, Yahushua, doesn't come from God's Word. Where does it come from? Okay? Be careful. Be careful. When someone says, this is godly, like I said, this is godly, First, they'll say, God's Word says, chapter and verse. This is godly, chapter and verse. This pleases God, chapter and verse. This tells us how to please God. And that's upset some of the brethren recently with, when it comes to holidays. Holidays. Oh, it pleases God, chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. Oh, this is a godly thing, chapter and verse. Brothers and sisters Christ, we are in the last days, and in these last days, you're really, it's, it's even hit me a little bit, you're really being trying to be motivated and pushed to compromise and to put this down and compromise to get along with the brethren. You're being pu pushed really hard by fa lost family members, co-workers, the, the neighborhood that you live in, uh, the world, to put this down so you can get along with everybody. I'm warning you, brothers and Christ, don't put this down. Stay in the Word of God, stay in prayer, and keep serving God with all your heart His way. Hide His Word in your heart every day. Stay in this book every day. I got Alexander Scorvey. Listen to Alexander Scorvey reading the Word of God. I sit out on the deck when I'm working, listening to Alexander Scorvey reading the Word. Some people are like, well, I like to listen to this preacher. And I like, you should be. I'm going to be honest with you. You should be at some point when you're newly saved and God's working on you and He's teaching you, you know, word studies, subject studies, expository studies, and you're learning so much like I did from, from men of God and everything. Yes, we need to be learning from men of God. But you should get to a point where you spend more time in this book than you do listening to Bible studies. Listen to this Bible study. Praise the Lord. But how much time do you spend in this book on your own? How much time do you spend reading this book on your own? Brother and sister Christ, God's made it so easy today. Alexander, if you have a bad eyesight, Alexander Scorvey. If you're a bad reader, where you're a very slow reader, you can listen to Alexander Scorvey read the Bible for you. So you can, remember, this book is not just meant to be read; it's meant to be heard and it's meant to be spoken. Those all three things. That's my prayer. I know we're supposed to be wrapping this up, but that's my prayer, brother and sister Christ, um, to God a lot is that in my old age, as I get older, because you read stories about how Isaac got old enough, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac got old where he, got, where he became blind. You got Jacob, he got, old, he got old where he could barely set up in bed. Our body falls apart, and one of the things I pray that no matter what happens is that I'll be able to read the Word of God, hear the Word of God, and speak the Word of God. You know, some people get old where they start losing their hearing. It happens. I'm not dissing anybody. As long as you can read it, see it, if you can't hear it, you can still see it. If you can't see it, you can hear it. If you can't see it or hear it, um, you got you can feel it. They got braille now, you know. God will find a way to keep you in God's word. But that's just one of my prayers, brothers and Christ, that it's meant to be heard, it's meant to be spoken, and it's meant to be um, read. But most importantly, most importantly, it's meant to be lived. Lived. 
But Brother Sister Christ, making sure you're spending a lot of your time in this book. A lot of your free time. I know some people don't have a lot of free time. A lot of your free time, whatever you can, you need to be spending it in this book. Okay, like I said, you can listen to Alexander Score. You read the Word of God as you're doing work. I listen to it in the garden. I listen to it when I have to do major work on the chicken coop. I listen to it setting out here on the deck. I have a little uh, iPod that I can listen to it if I have to go work on the hillside, clearing the paths and stuff. I start my day with this book, Lord, Brother Says Christ, and I end this day with this book. I pray and talk to the Lord as I read the book. I talk to the Lord about it. I seek His counsel, like we were talking about. When I read in the morning, I don't just read, okay, I read it, I'm done, and just put it down. I did that at first, Brother Says Christ, but it got to the point now that when I read, I'm reading it verse by verse, and I stop, and I start talking to the Lord about it. What am I supposed to get out of this, Lord? Oh, this... It used to be like, what do I get out of this? Now it's more like, Lord, that just hits home. I can see this in my life. I can see that in my life. Okay, next verse. Or I can see this or this verse. I remember this verse over here, Lord, that you showed me about this verse that we're reading here. And it reminds me of this, Lord. And Lord, and you start talking to the Lord and you're seeking his counsel. It's like you're having fellow. You are. You're having fellowship with the Lord going over his word and prayer. I hope that's where it gets to for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. You gotta stay in his word and you gotta stay in prayer and you gotta make sure that you're not just speaking, hearing, and reading this, but you're doing your best to hide it in your heart and live it. Okay. Please pray for me, brothers and Christ. I'm praying for you. Pray for men in ministry, like I said. Pray for the brethren as a whole. Uh, pray for the lost world as far as that God will give them every opportunity to get saved and that God will use you as a light to this dark world that God will open doors for you to lead people to Christ. Right? They might still reject, but that God will open doors for you to lead people to Christ. Right? And then give you the courage to walk through that door. So we're going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.